Well, isn't God good? Uh, I just want to share with you some praise that we have for God this week. You know, our team from Oklahoma, thank you guys for being here. Welcome. Uh, we're, we're glad you uh, are here to worship with us as well as uh, help us with our, our building projects. Uh, but, uh, you know, in putting this together, as you noted from what uh, my wife said a few minutes ago, uh, that uh, sometimes things uh, don't happen in a manner that you're comfortable with. Sometimes you have to just wait on the Lord. Uh, and that's kind of what happened. Everything uh, having to do with this team coming. God scheduled the team. Isn't that cool? And thank you for their sacrifice. He knew when they were coming. He knew exactly what was going to happen this week. Uh, and then we have been remodeling these facilities for quite a while. God has paid for all the remodeling. Isn't that great? Uh, but we were at the point where our balance in our, our growth fund and our balance in our building fund was pretty much zero. Uh, and we paid for everything to that point, so we were okay. But the team was coming. Uh, well, you know, for, you've heard, God provided the funds to be able uh, to have the team here and have the, equi have the material for them through his people. You know, we talked about the auction, but really what the auction was, was his people using their talents to provide different things, food and crafts, uh, neat things. Man, you wouldn't believe a one knife. You know, I was, I was set on bidding on that one knife, but Kim bid $300 right at the beginning. I... But I did get a cherry cheesecake for $360, and it's worth every penny. <laughs> It's just a fun way to raise the funds to do what God was doing. But also, what you may not know is that the city just approved our plans yesterday. I picked them up yesterday so that we can uh, be building on the building today, tomorrow. Isn't that cool? Yeah. yeah. Why, why God does it that way, I think, is because he wants us to know that it's from him. That it wasn't from us. <laughs> and that God does it so he can be glorified. Amen? Uh, amen. God's been that good to me this week. I had a couple concrete crews up at my house at the last minute to help me pour stuff. My, my wife and I live in a camper in a fifth wheel right now on our property. Uh, and uh, so please take as much of this cake that I bought for my wife as, as you can because we don't have room for it. <laughs> Only don't go out right now to get it, okay? <laughs> I'm sorry. Maybe I should have said something about that. <laughs> uh, so good to see everyone here this morning. We're in uh, traveling down the Roman road. We've been stopping along the way, chapter by chapter. In some chapters, we made several stops. Uh, but today, we're in chapter 14 of Romans. If you'd like to turn in your Bibles, please, to chapter 14. <clears throat> Uh, we're going to be speaking about living for others. Living for others. I, I think we have some demonstrations of that uh, all through the week, and we have demonstrations of that uh, scheduled for this week. If you have your Bibles, please turn to Romans chapter 14, and we'll stand in honor of God's Word in just a moment. Well, go ahead. Let's stand in honor of God's Word right now. Yeah. <laughs> First one. Romans chapter 14. Now accept the one who is weak in faith, but not for the purpose of passing judgment on his op opinions. One person has faith that he may eat all things, but he who is weak eats vegetables only. The one who eats is not to regard with contempt the one who does not eat, and the one who does not eat is not to judge the one who eats, for God has accepted him. Who are you to judge the servant of another? To his own master he stands or falls, and he will stand, for the Lord is able to make him stand. One person regards one day above another, another regards every day alike. Each person must be fully convinced in his own mind. He who observes the day observes it for the Lord, and he who eats does so for the Lord, for he gives thanks to God. And he who eats not, for the Lord he does not eat, and give thanks to God. For not one of us lives for himself, and not one dies for himself. 
For if we live, we live for the Lord. Or if we die, we die for the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and lived again, that he might be Lord both of the dead and of the living. But you, who do you judge your brother? Or you again, why do you regard your brother with contempt? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall give praise to God. So then each of us will give an account of himself to God. Therefore, let us not judge one another anymore, but rather determine this, not to put an obstacle or a stumbling block in the brother's way. I know and am convinced in the Lord, Jesus, that nothing is unclean in itself, but to him who thinks anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. For if because of food your brother is hurt, you are no longer walking according to love. Do not destroy with your food him for whom Christ died. Therefore, do not let what is to you a good thing be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. For he who in this way serves Christ is acceptable to God and approved by men. So then we pursue the things which make for peace and the building up of one another. Do not tear down the work of God for the sake of food. All things indeed are clean, but they are evil for the man who eats and gives offense. It is good not to eat meat or to drink wine or to do anything by which your brother stumbles. The faith which you have, have as your own conviction before God. Happy is he who does not condemn himself in what he approves. But he who doubts is condemned if he eats because his eating is not from faith. And whatever is not from faith is sin. Father, this passage needs to be read by us two or three times to get your meaning. Lord, I pray that you would reveal your meaning here to us today. That we would be able to understand how important it is that we live for others. That we live in community. That we understand how important it is that we live as a witness to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I pray, Lord, that you would help us Lord, to be able to understand what you're trying to say to your church today. That nothing that I say will get in the way of what you want to say to us today. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Well, I, I wanted to, uh, as I was looking at this title, uh, I, I came up with some quotes uh, Albert Einstein. Isn't Albert a cool name? <laughs> I'm even beginning to look like him. Let me show you. <laughs> uh, but he said this. He said, I believe in one thing, that only a life lived for others is a life worth living. And then one of our other heroes, I'm sure, is Bruce Lee, right? Right? I would demonstrate some kung fu to you, but the last time I demonstrated my kung fu to my wife, she had a bloody lip. <laughs> I won't hit you. I won't hit you. Don't worry. I'm just going to kick, and, and I'll just show you how close I can come. <laughs> you know, the second time, she was catching on. <laughs> Bruce Lee. Even Bruce Lee understood that real living is living for others. Living for others. Think about it. Uh, here is a quote from Martin Luther King. He said, life's most persistent and urgent question is, what are we doing for others? When you think about this, it's such a big question in our society because our, our society is so focused on self, isn't it? Uh, we're, we're to uh, grab all the gusto. We're, we're to live life to its fullest. Uh, we're, we're to uh, be able to do it my way. Remember that song made famous by uh, Frank Sinatra? I did it my way. Uh, we're supposed to uh, just do it. Just live for ourselves. It's all about me, after all, isn't it? It's all about what I want. <laughs> You're right. 
you're right, okay. No, it's not. <laughs> okay, we can cut right to the quick and we'll have an invitation. <laughs> Uh, but our society promotes all about us, all about me, all about what I want, what I desire. Uh, it's all about what I can gain. Uh, and really, where you come into the picture is where you can do something for me. Right? That's what our society often is about. Well, I think that's a pretty immature way of looking at things. I want to share with you, in, in a book called Search for Power, Harvard professor David C. McClellan uh, says that there are four stages in development of the individual to maturity. The first stage, he says, is where power is perceived as coming from others, but is directed towards oneself. We have a beautiful little baby girl in the back row. That little baby girl is in this first stage. It's proper for her to be in this first stage. Her mom and dad have power, but it's for her benefit. And when she goes, wah, they know it's one of two things. Input or output. <laughs> right? They know that baby's hungry or that baby has a problem on the other end. <laughs> and, and whether it is that... That is a stage of infancy. That's a stage of beginning. But unfortunately, a lot of adults are still in that stage. That's the stage where we feel like a victim. We feel like everything's against us. Where we feel like nothing's going our way. Everybody else has the power and they're being mean to me. It's a stage we need to grow through. It's a stage we need to get out of. Perhaps we can go to stage two. Stage two is powers perceived as residing within my, myself and, and is used for the needs of self. When you think about it, that, that's the stage that's promoted a lot in our society. You have the power to do what you want to do. You can do it. Uh, and, and you can get what you want. Just grab it. You can have everything. You just have to get out there and make it happen, right? That's actually a pretty immature stage of life where we think the power's within us and everything is about us. Everything should be for us and we can go out and get anything that would benefit us. But it's all, all through the lens of our own selfishness and our self focus. Stage three, however, is power is perceived as residing within oneself, but is used for the good of others. You see, perhaps somebody uh, famous like Mother Teresa or, or some other folks who were great philanthropists or, or people who are uh, serving in different positions uh, in waiting on and caring for other people. It's a wonderful Joan of Arc kind of, of, of a ideal that, that we have the power to make a difference in somebody else's life. And there's some truth to that. But honestly, we're not really as mature as we should be until we understand that power is perceived as being outside of us, coming through us to serve others. If we understand properly as Christians, our relationship with God, who has the power God does, right? He has the power. He has the ability. And he wants to share it with us so that God's love can flow through us to help others. To help others. Yeah, we'll feel loved along the way. Amen? And we'll feel his power and his grace along the way. But ultimately, the result is if we understand proper maturity that God has given to us that we might give to others. God has blessed us so that we might bless others. God has given us love so that we might share love with others, right? And if we're going to be spiritually mature, we're going to have to get out of stage one <laughs> where we're the victim. We're going to have to get out of stage two 
where it all depends on us. We're going to have to get out of stage three, where it's not just about us, but it's also about others. We're going to have to get to stage four, where we understand God has the power to help us to help other people. That's the highest level of maturity. Now that's somewhat of what I want to share with you today when we're talking about living for others. As we begin to think about living for others, in this passage, uh, it begins with verses 1 through 3. It says, Now accept the one who is weak in faith, for not, but not for the purpose of passing judgment on his opinions. One person has faith that he may eat all things, and he who is weak eats vegetables only. The one who eats is not to regard with contempt the one who does not eat. And the one who does not eat is not to judge the one who eats, for God has accepted him. Who are you to judge the servant of another? To his own master he stands or falls, and he will stand, for the Lord is able to make him stand. When I read this passage, one thing just jumps out at me. If I eat only vegetables, I'll be weak. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> For all us deer hunters and elk hunters, and <laughs> gives us a good excuse to be carnivorous. No, I, that's, I think I missed the point of this passage, if that's what I got out of it, right? <laughs> I, I really think what God is saying here is that judgment is not my right. Judgment actually belongs to the boss. And who's the boss? The Lord. Yeah. When you think about it, God is the creator. He's the sustainer. He is the ruler of all men. He has the right to judge. No one else does. He's given that right to the Son, but no one else does. And when, what does that mean? What does that mean? Does it mean that we can do whatever we want and have no standards? Do you know that we could have a hundred pianos up here? Uh, and if we tried to tune one piano to the other piano, we would never be able to have a, a single note that was harmonious. We have a hundred pianos up here, one tuning fork. And if all those pianos are tuned to that one tuning fork, then you can play any one of those pianos together and it will sound beautiful because it's tuned to the same standard. When I say we're not to judge, it doesn't mean that we don't have standards, folks. This is our tuning fork. This is our tuning fork. When I say we're not supposed to judge, it doesn't mean that God doesn't hate certain sins. He does. But he loves the sinner. He loves the sinner. And ultimately, he has sought to reconcile the sinner and to, to bring the sinner back into his grace. He created the sinner. He sustains the sinner. He is ultimately the ruler of all this world. Amen? Amen. Amen. He is sovereign. He is ultimately in charge. He has the right to judge. I don't. I have standards to live my own life by. And I have standards to know what righteousness looks like. And I am in the position of a pastor to be a fruit inspector for leaders in the church. Amen? I mean, if, if people aren't living according to the standard, then we're out of tune. Right? And if we get out of tune, how's the world going to be attracted to the music we make? How's the world going to be attracted to what we are called to represent? if we're not in unity before our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, so he is the one who has the right to judge. We keep his standards, but he is the one who brings judgment. He is the one that must do that. And f we see also in this passage, look down in, in uh, verses uh, 8 through 11, just real quick. It says, For if we live, we live for the Lord. Or if we die, we die for the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and lived again, that he might be Lord both of the dead and the living. But you, who are you to judge your brother? Or you again, who are you to regard your brother with contempt? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. 
For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall give praise to God. So then each of us will give an account of himself to God. You know, I think if we worried less about how people, other people were living and judging how they're living, worried a little bit more about how we're living, the world would be much better off, wouldn't it? If we're not living right, then how are we supposed to help somebody who's living wrong? I, I want to share with you what Jesus had to say about this just real quickly. It's found in Matthew chapter 7. He says, do not judge so that you will not be judged. For in the way you judge, you will be judged. And by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck that is in your brother's eye, but you do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, and behold, the log is in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye. And then you will see clearly to help to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Think about that. What's he saying? He's saying we spend all of our time judging when we have a big problem ourselves. What we should focus on is taking care of our problem so that then we're not judging our brother, we're helping our brother with their problem. It's not that they don't have a problem, they have a speck in their eye. But let's get the log out of our eye so that we can help them with a speck in their eye. I think it's important that we understand that we're going to stand someday to give a personal account but God, before God. You know, really, <laughs> I read about a Sergeant Ray Bartz of the Midvale, Utah Police Department. Uh, he happened to be getting into his wallet. I think it was to pay for a donut. I'm not sure. <laughs> but, but when he got into his wallet, uh, he noticed his driver's license had expired. And he, he thought about it for a minute. He thought, my driver's license expired. That's a punishable offense. So he got out his ticket book and he wrote himself a ticket and turned it in properly. So he appeared before the judge with his ticket. And the judge said, what is this? <laughs> what are you doing writing yourself a ticket? And he said this. He said, how could I give a ticket to anyone else for an expired license in the future if I didn't cite myself? Good point. Good point. How can I help anybody with a speck in their eye <laughs> when I've got an integrity problem myself? Right? Uh, we're all going to stand before God. Christ's judgment seat. Every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen? Amen. Everybody will stand before. Some will stand before God and receive punishment for their deeds. And levels of punishment in hell will be assigned to wicked people who have not responded in, to God's grace and mercy through Jesus Christ. And that's horrible to think about. But some will stand, they will bow their knees. Though they wouldn't do it on this earth, they will bow their knees eventually. And when they do, they'll receive punishment for the bad that they have done. Others will stand before God, recognizing Christ as Lord and their Savior. And there at the judgment seat of Christ will receive not punishment, not levels of punishment, but they will receive levels of reward. And I don't know what that be. You know, I'm thinking a tar paper shack on the wrong side of the tracks in heaven is much better <laughs> than anything anybody else is going to get. You know, I think to be able to receive from Jesus Christ, well done, thy good and faithful servant will be the highest reward we could possibly get in heaven. Amen. And that will be given to those who do not serve themselves, but who serve others. To those who do not judge others, but they judge themselves and understand where they stand before God so they can get it right with God. By the standard, by the tuning fork of God's word, they understand where they stand.
I, I read a little bit farther in this passage and it relates a little bit uh, to how we are to respond to each other. It says some eat meat and some who don't eat meat. And in that day, that was an important consideration and Paul addresses it uh, in other books in the scripture when he talks about meat that was sacrificed to idols. Some choose not to eat the meat because they know its source came from the sacrifice to an idol or to another god that wasn't really a god at all. And so they felt the meat was tainted. Paul, in his own personal opinion, felt like meat was meat. Right? It all tastes like chicken anyway. (laughs) That meat was meat. And he didn't see that it was a distinction. But he said, I will never eat meat again if it causes my brother, to stumble. Some had declared that one day was more important than another day. That we should worship on only Sabbath days. And you know Sabbath is from uh, sundown Friday night to sundown Saturday night. That that's when we were supposed to worship. Paul says all days are the same in the scripture. But he said, I'm not going to offend. I'm not going to be a stumbling block to someone who believes differently. Whether it's meat or whether it's drink, you know, uh, you know I, I know the Bible doesn't say thou shalt not drink alcohol in so many words. I, I do challenge you to read Proverbs 23, the last part of it. <laughs> it says when it bubbles in the glass, stay away from it. That's, that's pretty, <laughs> pretty straightforward to me. But I know that if I went, oh well, We had one of our church members who helped me pour concrete. Boy, I praise God for all those folks who helped me pour concrete this week. I I got surprised by a concrete company saying, we're coming now. (laughs) And and God arranged for people to be there to help me, and it was was great. But we had uh, one of our members tell uh, tell his wife that uh, he was going to pour concrete with the pastor, then knock down a few. (laughs) Now, he is also clean and sober for the last 15 years so he was only joking (laughs) okay but that points to the fact that if I did do that that would be horrible for my witness wouldn't it how many people would have a problem with their pastor being a drunk honestly if you know the history of this church many years ago there was a great church split because the pastor was spending his time in the bars witnessing. <laughs> uh, and it was not a good situation. You know, what I do matters to other people. You know, folks, if that's true with me, it's no different with you. Yeah, I, I, I really love the fact that that God gives pastors and church leaders an extra measure of the Holy Spirit so that they can resist temptation. I would really love that if it was true. If it was true. But you know, pastors, deacons, leaders in the church all have the same temptations that you do. Do you know that? And they don't receive anything extra to deal with them. They're just human like you and me are. You see, I I have temptations just like you do. But I have a great accountability before God with my temptations. So do you. And, And if I were to fall to those temptations, it could bring disastrous results on the kingdom of God. Amen? If you fall to those temptations, it can bring disastrous results on the kingdom of God. At least within your circle of influence, it can bring disastrous results to the kingdom of God. I am to be concerned with people's conception and people's belief. There are some gray areas out there where some people feel that it's okay to do this and other people feel it's not okay to do that. I choose to to practice not doing it to not offend those people who might feel that it's not okay to do that. You understand what I'm saying? Because I don't want to stand in. I don't want to be a stumbling block. I I don't want to keep anybody 
from following the Lord Jesus as our Lord and Savior. And if you can't find the scriptures that specifically says, thou shalt not, but you know that your witness will be heard if you do, then consider the fact thou shalt not because of the witness that you have with other people. Are we to live our lives codependent on what other people think? No. Actually, codependency is an ultimate sign of a immaturity because it's really not about what they think. It's really about what they think of me. Right? Codependency is one of those things I'm working on myself to care too much about what people think of me when it's really not about me, is it? Right? Not about me at all. It's about ultimately about others, about them, about the kingdom of God. And, and he mentions the kingdom as well. Uh, my freedom does not mean license to do whatever I want. My freedom means opportunity to do the things that will benefit the kingdom of God. Because a kingdom is more important than my opinions. The kingdom of God is more important than my opinions. I might feel it's all right to go and do some gray area that don't specifically get addressed in the tuning fork in the Bible. But if it hurts my witness with other people, I ain't going to do it. I ain't going to do it. Because ultimately it's not about me. It's about the kingdom. It's about the kingdom and what am I doing for the kingdom and what am I doing to prevent people from finding the kingdom of God. Actually, a kingdom focus requires me to consider others. If I'm really concerned about God's kingdom coming, if I'm really concerned about as many people as possible getting into God's kingdom, then I'm going to live my life. I'm going to judge myself, okay? Judge myself, live by the standard of God, and I'm going to live my life different than what the world says. Because I'm concerned about how many people leave this world and enter into heaven, God's kingdom. God's kingdom. I, that's pretty quieting, isn't it? <laughs> when you think about it. It causes me to be concerned about others. I really think these last few verses, let me read them to you. The last few verses Talk about our conscience. It's the faith, the faith which you have. Have as your own conviction before God. Happy is he who does not condemn himself in what he approves. But he who doubts is condemned if he eats because he, he's eating is not from faith. And whatever is not from faith is sin. There's a pastor who's getting ready to go to church one week. And, and he pulled out a shirt. And he was looking at the shirt, and you know, he didn't have a whole lot of shirts, but this particular shirt had a little bit of, of well, he'd worn it before, and it honestly was, it had a little bit of dirt. And he looked at it, and he said, well, it's not that bad. And so he asked his wife, honey, what do you think? Is this shirt okay to wear today? And she said these simple words, if it's doubtful, it's dirty. If it's doubtful, it's dirty. Now when it comes to the things that we do, what is the Holy Spirit pricking our conscience about? If it's doubtful, it's dirty. If the Holy Spirit's saying, now wait a minute, you shouldn't do that, don't do it. Don't do it. If your conscience says to you, that's not right, live by that. Right? Doesn't that make sense? God has given you your conscience. And not only has he given everyone a conscience. Boy, we'd be in sad shape as a world if he didn't, right? But he's enlivened your conscience through the Holy Spirit. So now, the Holy Spirit, one of his primary job is to convict of sin. So when the Holy Spirit says it's dirty... It's dirty, right? And if you are in doubt, then it's probably dirty. <laughs> really, we, condemn our, we can condemn ourselves by what we approve. We can condemn ourselves, as this scripture says, by what we approve. 
If we approve something that's different than what God approves, we condemn ourselves. Right? If we do something that we know that God doesn't want us to do, it doesn't matter if everybody else is doing it, but if we do something that we know God doesn't want us to do, we sin. Right? Does that make sense? You may say, well, yeah, but Matt gets away with that. <laughs> If God tells me not to do it, it doesn't matter what he tells somebody else. I'm not to judge them anyway. I'm to do what he told me not to do, right? Otherwise, it's saying we can condemn ourselves by doing what we know God doesn't want us to do or by not doing what we know God wants us to do, right? Because there's sins of commission and sins of omission, uh, so we can condemn ourselves. The second thing is we must not condemn others by what we approve. In other words, we may feel like, well, that's really not that bad. That's okay. My, you know, my, even my conscience is not giving me a hard time about this. I think it's all right. It's not addressed uh, specifically in God's word. Uh, and, and I think it's just going to be fine. But we have little eyes that are watching us. We have little feet that are following us. We have neighbors, co-workers, school chums that need Jesus. And we know that that's going to be a stumbling block for them. And don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. Because we can condemn others by what we do. We may think it's all right, but if we know it's going to be a problem in their receiving Christ as the Lord and Savior... We, like Ezekiel, can have blood on our hands if they don't receive Christ. That's pretty scary, isn't it? Isn't that scary, folks, to think about that? That your life has that much influence, but I'm telling you, your life has that much influence. Your life does count. There are people watching you, especially these little ones. They are watching you, and they will... They will follow your actions a whole lot more than they'll follow your words. You, they will do what you do, not what you say. Let your conscience be your guide. Be careful that you don't condemn yourself by what you do. And be careful that you don't condemn others by what you do. Really, honestly, if we have to ask the question, we probably have the answer. <laughs> Think about it. Is this shirt okay to wear? Well, ultimately, doesn't he really know what the answer is? If it was a new shirt, he wouldn't be asking the question. If it was a clean shirt, he wouldn't be asking the question. There's something going on with that shirt that he has to ask the question. If we have to ask the question, it might be a good clue that we already have the answer. <laughs> right? If it's doubtful. It's dirty. It does matter how we live our lives. It matters to us because we're all going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ someday. It matters to others because when we live our lives in a way that is not holy, that is not right, it affects other people, especially our children, especially those who are closest to us, who watch us, not just what we say, not just what, how we are on Sunday, but they see us every day. Especially to them, it matters. It matters how we live. Amen? We need to live for others. We need to live for others. I, I don't mean to be codependent what others think. I mean to live in consideration of others so that they can see Christ in us. So that they can see a witness go out that is untainted by a misconception or a preconception of what a Christian should be. They see the authentic, real Christian standing before them. That's what we need to live our lives for. Amen? Amen. Would you bow with me, please, in prayer? Our Father, we thank you that Jesus is our ultimate example. And Lord, we thank you that you have given us the opportunity and 
to be able to have Jesus forgive us of all of our sins, to have Jesus as our Lord and Savior. Lord, to be able to know that Jesus is the tuning fork for all of our lives. I pray, Lord, that we would live by his words, by the scripture you've given us. Lord, that we would live in such a way that we'd be good testimonies, good reflectors, that we'd be at that mature point where we realize that you have the power and we are channels of that to our world. You have the love and we are channels of that love to the world. Lord, that you would give us the gumption, the unction to live for you in everything we say, everything we do, and everything we don't do that we might consider living for you in front of others so that others can be drawn to you. In Jesus' name we pray.